Oh, the spark. This is CBC Here and Now. Well, it's Abbey Road, Cornerbrook style. I'll tell you all about the musicians in this beautiful mural on Broadway. Here, there, there's tons of great stores here, and it's, uh, I'm just not seeing the traffic like we used to. And how this colorful painting is really boosting business. That's ahead. Rain this story tonight. However, these warm temperatures are going to stick around. He must have felt so alone that nobody cared about him. I was kind of put in the position where I was the scapegoat. A system stressed and understaffed, fired from her job. The social worker says the province failed a 15-year-old who needed help. Tonight, she's speaking out. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Peter Cowan. That's our top story tonight. Wally Rich died by suicide in May. The Inutun teen was under the care of the province at the time of his death. Tonight, there are questions about how he fell through the cracks of a child protection system that was supposed to keep him safe. Questions raised by his family and the social worker assigned to his file. Here now's Heather Gillis reports, but first a warning. The details of the story may be alarming for some. In May, Wally Rich, an Inutin from Natwashish, died by suicide in a Labrador group home. His mother, Nympha Rich, says Wally was a good kid, but because of her drinking problem, he spent 10 years in care. Wally would have been alive right now if the SSD gave me a chance. Rich says her son was suicidal and should have been watched 24 7. She says Wally wanted to come home and be with her in Natwashish. She only brings a casket home, which is very sad, and I hate it. And it still hurts me. Rich doesn't trust social workers or the child protection system anymore. She says her son was always hungry when she visited him, and despite assurances that Wally was safe, she's now questioning the care he received at a group home. CSSD has built us a lot. They did a lot of damage to us since my son passed away. He must have felt so alone that nobody cared about him. Wally Rich's child protection file was one of more than 40 cases social worker Linda Saunders was responsible for. Saunders agrees and says there were major problems with the system, a system that ultimately failed Wally Rich. We're supposed to be there, the most vulnerable people in society. We're supposed to be there to help. And really at the end of the day, if we see one person gone, um, that's one too many. Saunders was a social worker in Happy Valley Goose Bay for six years. She took education leave to pursue a master's degree and returned to work mid-April, near the height of the coronavirus pandemic. The file caseload was double, probably even more than double from when I left. Saunders says staffing was reduced because at least four social workers had quit before her return to work. She says there was a lot of stress in the workplace. Pressure from the pandemic meant she was encouraged to work from home, but she didn't have a work phone or access to one of the 162 laptops the Department of Children, Seniors and Social Development deployed to staff. Plus, in-person visits were reduced, only allowed for urgent and high-risk cases. In the past, I would always go to homes, do visits. Obviously, that wasn't permitted. On Sunday, May 17th, over the Victoria Day long weekend. There was an incident with Wally Rich at the group home. But Saunders says she didn't find out about it until she returned to work on Tuesday afternoon. She searched for a supervisor to seek direction, but says no one was available. She says she had to move on to affidavits for court because her workload was so heavy. What next steps needed to happen, if anything? You know, was this, was this person monitored 24-7? Is that my call? It, or was it the supervisor and social worker that was on call at, at that time? She says the social worker and supervisor on call over the weekend didn't contact her about the incident and no one visited the teen 
in person. What did they do to ensure safety? They didn't. And then the next thing I know, you know, something serious happens. Sirius doesn't begin to describe what happened to Wally Rich. The next serious incident had the most serious consequence of all. Wally took his own life. Weeks after his tragic death, there were serious consequences for Saunders. She was fired. And should a child lose their life, I will leave no stone unturned to get to the bottom of why that happened. At the time of Rich's death, Lisa Dempster was the minister of CSSD, the department responsible for children in care. She can't reveal any details about the case or even confirm if Rich was in the provincial government's care. But she can say, when a child dies in the government's care, the child youth advocate and the chief medical examiner are notified. A human resources and file review begin, and they look into why the child was in care. While we want social workers to feel supported, you talked about a, a death of a child in care. There has to be a level of accountability as well. We're hiring professionals to do very important work. I want to get to the root problem. The province promised an inquiry into Inu children in care in 2017, but it still hasn't happened. The Inu Nation's Grand Chief, Etienne Rich, says Wally's death highlights the need for the inquiry to begin. It's a broken system. Is a dysfunctional system. We always said that it's hurting too many Inu kids and it's hurting too many Inu families. That's why we call for an inquiry to get those answers. But five months after Rich's death, the Inu Nation and the family still don't have answers from the provincial government. And we still haven't heard anything from them. I don't know what they're hiding. A million dollars was earmarked for the inquiry into Inu children and care in last month's provincial budget. Wally Rich's mother says an inquiry will give parents like her a chance to tell their stories about how the system failed them and broke their families. But no matter when the inquiry begins, its findings will be too late for Wally Rich. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. If you or someone you know is struggling, there is help call the Mental Health Crisis Line at the number below. There's also the Canada Suicide Prevention Services. You can also call or text and of course the Kids Help Phone which also offers live chat counselling on its website. All these numbers and addresses are available on our website cbc.ca slash nl. Well, some big promises delivered for daycare in this province. The Premier touted his affordable child care funding program this morning. But some critics are finding the $25 a day campaign has been oversold. Malone Mullen reports. This might look like a photo op. The new Premier talking affordable daycare with kids frolicking nearby. Critics would call it little more than that. The only people that benefit from this $25 a day announcement are middle class moms. There didn't seem to be any new information added to today's announcement. Andrew Fury's long touted campaign promise for $25 a day daycare will go ahead sooner than expected with subsidies planned to roll out in January. The money will go to daycares already receiving operating grants. But aside from the lower monthly bill for those parents, little else has changed much to the disappointment of those with a stake in the game. I could assume that we are in um, uh, an election year now. We have a new premier. Uh, so I can assume that they do want to have some announcements in a very difficult economic year uh, that will um, make it appear as though they're focused on families. Amid calls from the public to increase access to low cost or even nonprofit daycare or introduce full day kindergarten, Fury focused on big picture words rather than details. We want to be uh, right there leading the pack, but this is the first, uh, this is the first look, the first major investment in towards moving towards something bigger and bolder. The government is undertaking a mandatory review of the child care system ahead of schedule to see if it can cut red tape for small daycares that want in on the subsidy program. Theoretically, that would increase the number of $25 a day spots. But as for concrete next steps, today's announcement left more questions in its wake. 
That means anyone with concerns about how childcare is delivered or who can get these new affordable fees will have to wait until next year. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. Another frosty start to the morning today. Here's where our temperatures were sitting. Another two degree morning for St. John's five in Stephenville. And then we've got those temperatures even up through Makovic sitting around six degrees earlier this morning. Uh, temperatures rebounded again beautifully, even sitting above seasonal for most of us. 12 to as much as 15 degrees along the south coast, though, sitting in those cooler temperatures, only reaching a high near nine degrees in Portabasque. And we can thank uh, some rain that has moved in. So here's a look at that area of low pressure working its way towards uh, the province as we head through the night tonight. We're going to see these showers spread further west or further east as well. We do have rainfall warnings in place along the southern portions of the island. Uh, rec house wind warning with gusts upwards of about 120 kilometers per hour and that will continue through tonight. <music> The Chief Medical Officer of Health is warning today that more cases of COVID will come, but don't be alarmed. Right now, there are eight active cases in the province, a lot higher than people are used to. But Dr. Janice Fitzgerald says it hasn't been spreading in the community, only to close contacts of people who've traveled. I understand that these new cases may create fear and anxiety for in some individuals, particularly after our province has had uh, lengthy stretches without many cases. The reality is that we will continue to see new cases. The goal here is containment of the virus to prevent spread. Now, one of the recent cases involves someone who traveled from Alberta living in the central health region. Public health now says this person may have been in contact with more people who will need to be tested, but they're not giving very many details. There was more information that came forward. I can't really speak to specifics because of privacy issues, but uh, more information did come forward that uh, suggested that uh, perhaps we had to uh, look a little further uh, for contacts, uh, and that's what public health is in the process of doing right now. So anyone who is considered a close contact during the infectious period, that's very important to remember um, that they will be notified uh, to uh, that they are a close contact and that they have to quarantine. Now, with one turkey holiday over, the next one is Christmas. It may seem like a long way away, but officials are already trying to figure out is there a way that families across the country can still come together? Today, Fitzgerald says she knows how important that is. But we also have to think about where people are coming from and what the risk is and uh, the risk of uh, um, spread in the communities when we uh, when if we allow that. So uh, those are all things that we're talking, you know, we're talking through or we're, we're considering at this point in time. And and to be honest, at this point, it's probably just a bit too early to really make any kind of prediction. Well, with questions about just how people are going to get here, here's a news story for you. WestJet is slashing flights across eastern Canada, including this province. It is eliminating 100 weekly flights in the region. Starting on November 2nd, the company won't fly in or out of Moncton, Fredericton, Sydney, Charlottetown or Quebec City. In this province, WestJet is cutting the direct flight from St. John's to Toronto. Now, that was a daily option before COVID. The company is keeping the full St. John's to Halifax schedule, flying that route 11 times per week. Now, seasonal WestJet flights out of Gander and Deer Lake are scheduled to restart next spring, but so far, no word on how these latest suspensions change that. Well, to come by chance now, where a growing list of potential buyers is giving a rattled workforce a much needed morale boost. It might also be the start of a chain of events that could see consumers pay more for transportation as well as heating fuels this winter. But as Terry Roberts reports, uncertainty about the future of the oil refinery prevails. Worried refinery workers gathered inside the Arnold's Cove Lions Club today, a series of information meetings hosted by their union. Many went inside expecting more bad news but they emerged an hour later feeling a little more upbeat. This has given us hope, the hope that we need to keep on going. Before coming here, I expected probably the worst, uh, but the news on October 5th that refinery may close, uh, I feel a lot more optimistic that's not gonna happen now. I feel more, a little bit positive they come to that meeting. That's good, that's good. I'm, I'm happy about that. And um, we'll just see where, you know, we just gotta wait and see. 
The list of potential buyers for the idled refinery has grown to three. A source says a U.S. company called Origin International is a serious player. But two other mystery companies are also showing interest in a refinery that hasn't produced anything since April. It gives encouragement to workers who've been, uh, since uh, last Monday, uh, have been devastated by what's happening here. What happens next is out of their hands, but their preferred outcome is written on their faces. 30-year-old man, I have two kids, a wife, a house, vehicles, and uh, currently no job, no prospects. And uh, only hope now really is that one of the other companies decides to buy or at the very least the government steps in and uh, gets us back on track again, right? I'm a lab technician at the refinery, so um, my job is pretty precise. Uh, it's not like something that I can go away and, and do the same work that I've been doing here for the past 26 years. It's, uh, it's my life. It's our livelihood, and we put everything into it. This is why it hurts so much to see it go. And there's another development here. Nearly all of the fuels sold in this province come from Come By Chance. And I've learned the refinery's marketing arm has applied to the Public Utilities Board for an increase in the regulated wholesale price of gasoline, diesel, and home heating fuels in a bid to generate more revenue in order to ride out this crisis. The refinery is a major polluter and an economic driver. If the operation can't find a new owner, it could be mothballed a scenario that would reduce its attractiveness to a potential buyer, especially if it were to sit idle through a Newfoundland winter. Industry sources say the current owners have asked the provincial government for financial support, and if that help doesn't come, they just might proceed with complete shutdown, a worst-case scenario for these workers. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Arnold's Cove. A letter obtained by CBC News says former executives of IBEW 2330 have to pay back millions of dollars. Union members have been speaking out about apparent money mismanagement for years now. And as Jeremy Eaton reports, they may finally be getting some answers. The vocal local from Holyrood has long sought to see the books of its union brass. We never could seem to get any answers. We were always told everything was all right. Kevin Slaney and others ran to replace a former executive and won. He was elected vice president of the union. That gave him access to the finances. Two years ago, he got to see what he says the former executive was hiding. Starting into our finances, we realized that the matter was probably much too big for us to even handle ourselves and that the, the amounts of money that, had, uh, that appeared to be missing were, you know, you know it, it was unbelievable what was going on there. Those amounts of money added up to over $2.2 million. According to a letter from the union's head office, six former union executives are guilty and are being ordered to pay back money. Quite easy when uh, you have everyone on your side, your own bookkeeping, and you don't follow procedures. In our, in our uh, constitution, we are supposed to do uh, quarterly audits. None of these audits were ever done. However, the 50-year union member claims much more than $2.2 million is missing. This is a very, very small number compared to the amount of money that actually went into our hall. One year in particular there, there was uh, close to $8 million in dues that went into our hall, and uh, there's no real explanation uh, to how or where it was spent. This is the hall he's talking about. It was completed just a few years ago. Now gone bust, according to the letter from the union higher-ups. The IBEW college has been placed into bankruptcy with a local law firm acting as a trustee. While the college is separate from the local union, members are far from happy about its fate. Would easily make money for everyone, uh, provided that the, uh, the business side of it was ran properly. I guess the interest was more in the filling their pockets than worrying about actually what the, what the college was doing. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Mount Pearl's mayor is back on the job. Dave Aker temporarily stepped down in June when allegations were made against him under the city's respectful workplace policy. Andrea Power accused the mayor of harassment and misogyny. She's one of two councillors dismissed after she was accused of colluding with Steve Kent during a harassment probe. Power says Aker oinked at one woman and made a reference to another female councillor's weight. She says it happened during the same meeting in which she was voted out. An independent investigation has found the claims were mostly unsubstantiated, that a joke was made out of carelessness, not malice. 
Mayor Aker released a statement which reads in part, I'm committed to learning from this investigation. I'm committed to improving how we work together. I'm also committed to ensuring that council and staff adhere to the principles of a respectful workplace. Well, to the West Coast now, after months of darkness, a new painting is brightening up Broadway in Cornerbrook. There's a large mural featuring local entertainers on the side of the Village Music Building, and the store owner hopes that it will attract businesses back to the city's downtown core. Here now is Colleen Connors reports. It's the first thing you see when you drive down Broadway. I'm elated, right? Um, the mural itself, again, it looks way better than what I had envisioned in my mind. I didn't think there'd be this amount of detail. I certainly didn't think you'd recognize the people. No, it's not George, Paul, Ringo and John. It's four Cornerbrook based musicians. First, we have Keelan Purchase. He's a great accordion player. He's played on uh, played in the store a bunch of times. Uh, we have Wade Jones. He's the only professional ugly stick player that I know. And then we have Leah Voki Singh. She used to instruct violin here. And then um, I didn't want to be in the mural. That kind of looks familiar. Yeah, I didn't really want to be in the mural, but my wife Tanya said, Sheldon, you got to be. With help from some funding from the city and paint supplies from the paint shop next door, Power called up his school art teacher and asked if he would bring this idea to life. Oh, I'm very proud, yes. Uh, just a real feeling of satisfaction. And um, just well, I'm happy with the way it turned out. It, it turned out very close to the way in, I envisioned it, which is uh, important to me. Bishop spent 35 days painting in a makeshift art studio in the basement of the music shop. Yes, yes, to, to have the feeling of movement and, and the, the gaiety of, and, and, well, Newfoundland music is fun, right? And I wanted to try and get, capture the fun of it. Power hopes that fun and vibrancy attracts shoppers to stores after seven months of COVID restrictions. Our little mom and pop shops, um, especially along Broadway here, there, there's tons of great stores here. And it's, uh, I'm just not seeing the traffic like we used to. So we're uncertain. So things like this could potentially bring people back down around. And it seems to be working. It's nice. Yeah? It's, uh, it reminds me of Abbey Road. So, yes. <laughs> I walked by it the other day and I thought it was pretty cool because I love the Beatles. I think they uh, recreated the Abbey Road scene uh, just as good or better than what the Fab Four themselves did it, you know? Across the street, menswear store owner Chris Rogers agrees. He felt the crunch of COVID-19 with weddings and graduation cancellations. Well, I thought it was an awesome idea. Really unique for the street, you know, it brings people around and look at the mural and just which, which, which we need downtown, you know, more color. I think a lot of people are, you know, coming downtown to support us more now, especially with the COVID on. And we need the business, that, we definitely need the business. So, Staff at Village Music are coming up with a contest to have the public name this beautiful mural behind me. It's all another way to hopefully boost some business here on Broadway. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Sun is setting on a beautiful fall day. Temperatures are going to be fairly mild as we head through the next week or so. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Welcome back to Here and Now. It definitely feels like fall, although actually it's, it's a nice fall. It's one with sunshine. At least for eastern parts of Newfoundland. Today. That's right. Yeah, it was uh, a beautiful day. A little bit more chilly, though, or felt chilly, just because we uh, saw a little bit that more wind. Nip in the air. That's yeah. right. That's got that nip in that air. Exactly. Uh, let's take a look at the current temperatures right now. We're sitting at about 10 degrees here in St. John's. Similar temperatures, uh, 12 in Stephenville, and then we've got those uh, chillier temperatures as well up through. The northern portions of the province, eight in Nain and four in Lab City right now. So we do have an area of low pressure that's working its way towards us. The warm front will lift as we head through the night tonight, and it is bringing some showers and cloud cover up through Labrador as well. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see some of that heavier rain down along the southern portions of uh, the island, southwestern portions of the island. That will generally continue as we head through the night tonight, work their way further east through central into the overnight uh, northern portions as well and uh, southeastern portions of Labrador. And then by the time tomorrow morning rolls around, that's when we'll start to see those showers for the Avalon and the metro area. And then in behind that, we should actually see some clearing skies for parts of the province as well. Overnight temperatures tonight, not really going to move too, too much. So around nine degrees for St. John's. Uh, those winds will ramp up, though, even more. So we're looking at uh, southerlies or southeasterlies gusting anywhere from 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. That wreck house area, though, uh, still going to see those gusts in excess of about 120 kilometers per hour. Even areas along the coast for the west, you could see some gusts near uh, 80 kilometers per hour overnight tonight. Temperatures will dip to about two degrees for Lab City. However, you're probably going to stay as rain. You might see some wet snow mix in at times, but overall we're looking at uh, about six degrees for Cartwright and four in Nain overnight tonight. So that rain's going to work its way further east as we head through tomorrow, generally clearing in behind that. Uh, but it will be a generally gray, drizzly day for most of the island, or rather most of eastern Newfoundland as we head through tomorrow. P cloudy periods up through Labrador as well. Then the next system is going to bring in some more showers for you in Lab West and then potentially the northern portions as we head into the evening hours uh, tomorrow. The winds are uh, not going to be too bad into the afternoon once that cold front rolls through, but this is what we're looking for. As far as rainfall, the most will be down the southwest. That's why we have those rainfall warnings in. It's looking like a good 50 millimeters is possible. Pockets of heavier rain is also certainly possible. Uh, but otherwise, that's where most of the rain will be. The Buren Peninsula, uh, potentially 20 to 30 millimeters. But other than that, anywhere from 10 to 20 is, uh, is a good bet. Here's where your temperatures will be sitting into the afternoon. So you're looking at your winds easing a little bit in the west, down to about 40 kilometers per hour, but going to hang on to those windy conditions in the east. Temperatures will be sitting in the teens, so above seasonal for this time of year. We should be sitting around 11 degrees as our daytime high, so that's certainly welcome. 14 in Corner Brook with plenty of sunshine into the afternoon. There's your temperatures up through Labrador. Uh, teens for southeastern and then uh, eventually into those single digits. Again, your winds are going to ramp up into the afternoon uh, and evening hours for areas in Lab West as well. As we head through into Friday, looking like it'll probably stay gray for eastern areas, clearing out for the rest of the island, and then we'll see more showers move through uh, up through Labrador and uh, pretty much just stick around through the day on Friday. You can see some of that shower activity working its way opposite from what we normally see. We normally see west to east, but looks like we'll see an east to uh, west movement of some of these showers as we head into Saturday as well as we get into some of that onshore flow. However, temperatures are going to stay mild, though. We're looking at about 18 degrees by Friday, hitting that 20 degree mark uh, for Saturday or for Corner Brook, rather a little bit cooler along the southern portions, only reaching a high near 11 for Port Basque. But look at these warmer temperatures making their way up into Labrador as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay, 16 degrees will be the afternoon high on Friday and Saturday. <laughs> temperatures stick around as well. You're looking at plenty of sunshine, uh, cooler with showers for Lab West and up through the northern portions, maybe a few flurries working their way in into the evening hours. Uh, but overall, another summer, late summer, 
kind of day uh, with the potential for some showers and warmer temperatures, uh, a little bit cooler for St. John's, only sitting around 14 degrees. The reason for that again is where that jet stream is sitting. So we're going to see this warm, moist air move up again, that big dip in that trough uh, over Canada or over central Canada rather. And again, it's going to stick around. Maybe next week we'll see a little bit of a dip, but then those temperatures will move right back up. And because we should be sitting around 11 degrees, these temperatures should be sitting in the teens as well. Here's where you're looking. Look at those overnight lows. We're not really moving much temperature wise over the next little bit, but again, it does look like it will be unsettled for most of us as we head into next week. That's when we'll see those overnight temperatures dip, but overall plenty of 19, 20 degree temperatures in play for us. For Eastern Labrador, sunshine and temperatures in the teens as well. And then you'll see some flurries make their way back in for Lab West as we head into Monday. Just wanted to share this beautiful shot. Gorgeous evening in Virgin Arm. Thank you so much to Christina for sharing that with us. And if you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Thank you very much, Ashley. We're taking a closer look this week at how the slump in the oil industry is affecting companies that service offshore installations. There are two ways to transport people and equipment to platforms like Hibernia and Hebron, by sea and by air. Both are seeing a dramatic decline in business. In this first of a two-part series, Here Now's Terry Roberts takes a look at the air link provided by Cougar Helicopters. If you're in the east end of St. John's and looking for a sign of the challenges facing the oil industry, just look up. These familiar Sikorsky helicopters are not as common as they once were. Back in February, March, uh, we would have had at the height about 11 aircraft under contract. At the conclusion of October, we'll probably see ourselves with about five machines uh, on their contract. Cougar is king when it comes to getting workers to their offshore jobs. From this gleaming new hangar, where expert technicians spend hours fine-tuning these $30 million birds. But the bright lights and fresh paint can't hide the darkening mood. Uncertainty is being kicked around like dust in a chopper's rotor wash. A plan to expand this facility has been shelved. Air and maintenance crews let go. We made adjustments so far, probably 16 to 18% of our workforce is affected. And more layoffs are coming after this drill rig finishes a job for Equinor in the Flemish Pass. I thought of the movie The Perfect Storm when I was thinking about our business these days because we have the combination of uh, the COVID, the downturn in the oil and gas business by itself, and then we have what we call natural termination in our business where some contracts are, contracts are coming to a conclusion. So you put three of them together at once, yes, it's had, it's had some major impact to our business for sure. Drilling is suspended on Hibernia. Insiders say about half the workforce has been sent home. Rather than doing uh, 10 to 12 flights a week to Hibernia, we're down to probably five or six flights a week to Hibernia. The Terra Nova is anchored here in Conception Bay. Hasn't produced oil in nearly a year. Its very future is unclear. Some major exploration and expansion projects have either been deferred or cancelled outright. Combine that with the decommissioning of two natural gas projects in offshore Nova Scotia. A year ago, there were a thousand people working in offshore Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. By the end of this month, Hank Williams believes that number will drop below 400. That means fewer flights and more layoffs. Worst thing I think that any employer can do is when you see uh, good people, have good people, highly skilled, highly trained people walk out the door. You, you know, there's been an investment in technology and there's also a big investment in people, their training and, and the expertise that they provide us. Uh, yes, to see that walk out the door uh, is difficult. And, and, and I guess in these times, uh, what's probably secondary more difficult than that is that the job market is not that bright out there in the aviation industry. But I'm optimistic those, uh, those people that went out the door uh, uh, that have, uh, we've had to release, uh, yes, I hope I can get them back in short order and, and the shorter the better. Uh, it would be nothing better to make that call and say, get back here, you know, we're, we're peaking here again. Williams is confident things will rebound, but in the meantime, he's doing his best to keep employees from getting distracted. This is not the type of business where you want to lose focus. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, as midterm break wraps up on an empty MUN campus, hundreds of students voice their dissatisfaction about online learning. There are perfect. real challenges to doing some so kinds of teaching online. Winter stretches in. Don't go away.
Not a lot of people here on the campus of Memorial University because most courses are being offered online. Marcus Furlong is hoping to be a paleontologist someday. He studies the sciences. So you have decided to launch this uh, petition on the behalf of students. What was the motivation for, for starting this petition? It was mainly the decline in quality of education that we're seeing, as well as what I believe to be a relative safety that we're afforded here in Newfoundland. So when you say safety, you mean because COVID is relatively low? Yeah, I would say that that's the reason. Newfoundland is also isolated. We're probably one of the safest places to be in the world right now. You've got hundreds of people who signed your petition. What What is upsetting students at Munn? What's upsetting is the education quality is absolutely horrendous this semester as, a peer, as opposed to others before. We have terrible communication with professors. We're unable to get timely quality uh, assistance with our studies and questions. Um, some people don't have suitable learning environments at home. They have technology issues. Some people have learning conditions which inhibit them from learning at home. And it's just ridiculous how far the education has fallen here. And with respect to the professors, do, do all the professors know how to teach online? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, the, the amount of time that we're forced to right, spend guys, on Mace. doing each individual course has increased as a result of the way the university has adapted their courses online. So people who are doing not full course loads anymore are feeling like they're doing a full course load. And people who are doing a full course load, they feel like they're overworking themselves. And I guess it's important to point out, you're not just talking about the class, which can be in real time or recorded, but also if you have to do group work, that's online. If you're doing exams and quizzes, those are online. The research is online. How much time are students spending in front of a, of a screen? Hours, hours, hours every day. And in, in most cases in isolation as well. And in terms of you know what you paid for, right? People decide they're gonna pay tuition. Now the, the amount of tuition is always a debate, but given what you paid for, are you getting your money's worth? No. No, I, I don't think I don't think I am getting my money's worth, but I'm left in a position where I either continue my studies or I put them on halt for who knows long. So Marcus, what kinds of comments are you getting by people who are signing the petition? The overall take I'm getting from the comments are people are feeling like their education quality is abysmal now and that we're in a position where Memorial could potentially, at the very least, increase the amount of on-campus activity. Why do you think this is happening given the ha fact we have so few cases? I mean, you can understand the fall, perhaps, but the decision to continue online really until next June, I guess, what do you make of that decision? It could be three things. Either they really do think that we have a huge health problem here that Newfoundland, we wouldn't be able to deal with this if we open it up. Uh, the second thing could be that Memorial University is choosing what's easier for them rather than what's best for the students. And the other thing could be that typically a lot of institutions in Newfoundland are followers rather than leaders. They're just following the mainland rather than taking the lead when we can. All right, now what, uh, you know, here we are, it's the fall. Do you think there's any chance that Munn might say, you know what, um, looking at the projections for the cases, we're, we're actually going to reopen the winter. We've changed our mind. Do you think there's any chance of that? The only chance of that happening, I think, is, is with people um, speaking up against it. I think that if there wasn't anyone speaking up against it, like I am, that they'd just go straight ahead with it. Well, we'll definitely keep our eyes on, on what happens with this story. Uh, Marcus, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Marcus outlined his case for what isn't working for university students, but what is the online reality like for professors? Well, Josh Leposky is a professor of geography at Munn. Professor Leposky, what was the transition to online education like for you? Well, it was fast. Uh, for me personally, um, this all seems maybe for a lot of us uh, way back in time, but back in uh, gee, February or March, when uh, we uh, had to make the the shift, it was really you know a matter of days from going to in person or going from I should say in person classes uh, to being online. And as you've tried to teach your students in this new online world, what what's your sense of what the response from students has been like? Um, so it's not um, you know necessarily negative, uh, but. You know, there can be some drawbacks to being um, online. Uh, it's harder to read body language, for example. It's, uh, it can be harder to have a more, uh, you know, direct interpersonal relationship with students. Some people can thrive in that environment, be they students or professors, and, and others less so. So it, it's mixed so far, I would say. Is it easy for you to tell, okay, these students are getting it, these ones aren't? I mean, how do you get that kind of feedback? You know, it is a learning process of trying to keep track of sort of multiple parts of, uh, of an online interface. 
I suspect, uh, you know, students um, uh, also find that kind of thing can be challenging. They're having to, you know, pay attention to uh, my voice or fellow students' voices. They may also uh, be needing to watch the chat uh, for additional information or questions coming in. So, um, you know, none of us have really had a lot of time um, to practice these skills. What about some of your, uh, shall we say, more experienced colleagues? The comfort levels with the technology. Munn is using so many different platforms uh, to teach online. Are professors, you know, equally competent with these technologies? We're we're all people, uh, fa uh, faculty and students, with with a range of skills, and um, especially given the timelines that we have had to operate under in the switch to remote. Um, you know, I, I really think uh, people are, are um, doing the best they can. Um, you know, some of the guidance at Memorial, say, for, for developing true online classes, um, you know, you need a minimum of nine months to do that. And, um, you know, back in February and March, we had literally, we had a matter of days, perhaps 72 hours to go from in-person teaching to online even with the, with the most recent um, decision uh, to have the winter semester online, that's only a few months away. Nothing like, you know, the, the lead times of nine months for uh, developing true online pedagogy. So obviously more time is, uh, it would be nice to have them. It's just time that we don't seem to have. I'll ask you a last question. As, some, as a professor who appears to really enjoy teaching in a classroom the way we used to before COVID, where do you get your personal job satisfaction as, as a university professor teaching undergraduate students these days? Can't be replicated exactly uh, in a remote teaching um, uh, environment, but I have been personally surprised uh, um, at uh, enjoying uh, the remote teaching experience. Uh, that comes from someone who really uh, enjoys being in the classroom and you know, directly interacting with students. All right. Well, listen, Professor Lepowski, appreciate your time and um, all the best. Thank you very much. Good luck in the uh, winter semester. Sure. Thank you. So criticisms from a student, observations from a geography professor. Tomorrow on Here and Now, Memorial University's leadership weighs in. Will campus reconsider reopening given the province's low prevalence of COVID? Anthony puts that question to Munn's provost and vice president academic. You have to appreciate that if we go fully open, that's 19,000 students in a very small space, a very small footprint. We have considerable crowding. That's a really high risk that we would be taking, uh, especially if there is no vaccine available, because you have to remember 100% uh, of the population is susceptible to this virus. So what we want to do is, is be able to take advantage of facilities on campus, but not simultaneously expose the population to undue risk.
People here and everywhere in Atlantic Canada are watching the outbreak of cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. It's the first major outbreak since the Atlantic bubble opened up travel. But what would it take to kick New Brunswick out and bring in travel restrictions? Well, I asked that question this afternoon. Uh, certainly with regard to New Brunswick, uh, we would be seeing more community spread, sort of the so what we'll be looking for are what we call non-epilinked cases, so cases where we couldn't find a source uh, of infection. Um, so the information that we've received from New Brunswick at this point uh, doesn't indicate that, and certainly they've done a very thorough job at doing their investigation. It's been a very stressful uh, week or so for them, for sure, um, and uh, they're working very hard to make sure that they're getting uh, all these contacts identified and quarantined and uh, um, so we are watching the situation closely. We're in fairly um, regular contact, almost daily contact, and, uh, and we'll certainly be, um, uh, you know, if, if anything changes, we'll certainly uh, make recommendations to that effect. If someone's traveling here from, for example, Campbellton or Moncton, they don't have to isolate. What's the risk that they could bring in the disease and spread it because they don't have that isolation period? So the risk at, this, at the moment, uh, certainly in those areas, it is slightly higher than say it would be in other areas of New Brunswick, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it's still not real high. Um, and um, certainly when they come back into the province, we've, we've asked people to stay away from higher risk areas, so crowded places and um, any large gatherings. People are wearing a mask when they're indoors in, in, um, in public spaces. Um, so, you know, we've already instituted a fair number of uh, precautions that would help to protect in this situation. Across the pond now where new social distancing restrictions took effect today in Liverpool. Here's what some people did last night before the clock struck midnight. Only Liverpool was placed in the highest risk category for England when the plan was unveiled earlier this week, but now health officials are considering adding other areas of Northern England, including Manchester. Northern Ireland has the highest infection rate in the UK and it is preparing to shut down schools for two weeks. Researchers in Japan have used a supercomputer to learn more about the aerial dispersion of COVID-19 particles. And what they've learned is that humidity can play a large role. Computer graphic simulations point to how the virus is more likely to spread in winter's dry indoor conditions. It suggests using a humidifier when window ventilation isn't possible may help limit infections. The study also showed face shields aren't as effective as masks at preventing the spread of aerosols. You just get this weird feeling in here. It was like somebody's watching it. There was a white like object in the shape of a person that moved across the window. Creepy tales of the unexplained. I remember walking home and I thought I heard, you know, a crack of a whip and I was I said, it can't be, is that really? And then I heard it again and I, I just started running. The haunting of spooky stories from across the province, Thursdays in October on Here and Now.
take you to the isolated southwest coast in the very first of this fall's archival specials. It's our season debut, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Beautiful weather in that archival special. Before we go, Ashley, give us an idea. What can we expect? For tomorrow, we're looking at uh, just some showers working their way across the board. Let's take a look at that there. Uh, 16 degrees will be the afternoon high. The winds will stay a little bit brisk as well, uh, gusting upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. However, that sun should shine for the rest of uh, the island tomorrow. And then if we take a look at the temperature trend for the St. John's metro area, it's looking beautiful. Should be sitting around 11 degrees this time of year, but temperatures will be sitting in the teens as we head into the beginning of next week. So certainly welcome. Yeah, it was great to see that we had all that nice weather in September and the nice weather train just keeps on choo choo chewing along. <laughs> I'll take it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Lots of fans for Ashley with all this uh, great weather. Yeah, and so, for sure. Uh, keep it coming. Mm -hmm, I'll try. <laughs> and that's it for us for here and now this evening. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow night. Good night. Good night.